Good morning, Spellman. It's Friday, April 10th, 2020. It's Good Friday, and we're on Easter break. On today's show, CS1 makes it big time. We continue our look at a day in the life of a pilot. Haley Mateo takes a look back at the past football season with members of the team. And Christina Rocaldi has your weekend weather forecast. I'm Anna Richardson. And I'm David Smalls. We're your pilots. And this is your morning flight. So guys, that mass last Wednesday, not going to lie, it gave me some sense of normalcy in life. With Yes, our- it, it definitely did. You know, uh, being able, usually we would be in our seats at the um, at the mass in the auditorium, mm-hmm. seeing the stages of the cross go around the um, uh, gym. But this time, at least we had a chance to even, you know, attend the Experience mass. Experience it. it was- and, yeah. Yeah. Thank you to Father Pilsner for holding that for us. Well, let's soar right into the news. Father Luke gets things started with a new flight of faith. This week, he talks of Good Friday and the greatest mystery that lies ahead. Welcome back to the flight of faith here on Good Friday. As we enter into the mystery of the death of the Son of God, many will be moved to tears as they experience the Lord embracing them in their own suffering. Tears come easily to some in these moments. Pope Francis has often spoken of tears as a gift, not something we often think of in that way. Let us listen to the words of the Holy Father to understand how our sorrow can be transformed into joy, that is, how tears can be a gift. On the 12th of February this year, Pope Francis said, I've often spoken about the gift of tears and of how precious this is. Can one love in a cold way? Can one love as a function and out of duty? Certainly not. There are some afflicted people who need comforting, but sometimes there are also some comforted ones who need to be afflicted, reawakened, who have a heart of stone and have forgotten how to cry. There's also the need to reawaken those who do not know how to be moved by the sufferings of others. Grief, for example, is a bitter path, but it can serve to open our eyes to life and the sacred and irreplaceable value of each person. And at that moment, one realizes how short time is. The Pope is teaching us that tears and grief can open our hearts and remind us of what really matters. He has said that sometimes tears are the only true response to the question of why innocent suffer. In January 2015, the Pope listened to a 14-year-old boy in Manila, Philippines, describe life on the streets as a struggle to find food, to fight the temptations of sniffing glue and to avoid adults looking for the young to exploit and abuse. The Pope also heard from a 12-year-old girl rescued from the same streets. She covered her face with her hands as she wept in front of the Pope, but she managed to ask him, why did God let this happen to us? Pope Francis said, a real answer was impossible, but the question itself was important. And the tears that accompanied the question were even more eloquent than the words. Certain realities of life, he said, are seen only with eyes that are cleansed by tears. For people who are safe, comfortable, and loved, he said, learning how to weep for others is part of following Jesus, who wept at the death of Lazarus and was moved with compassion at the suffering of countless others. If you do not know how to weep, You're not a good Christian, so says the Pope. In an apostolic exhortation to young people, Christus Vivi, or Christ Lives in English, the Pope again spoke of the importance of tears. As a church, may we never fail to weep before those tragedies of our young people. May we never become inured to them. For anyone incapable of tears cannot be a mother. We want to weep so that society itself can be more of a mother so that in place of killing, it can learn to give birth, to become a promise of life. We weep when we think of all those young people who have already lost their lives due to poverty and violence, and we ask society to learn to be a caring mother. None of this pain goes away. It stays with us. 
because the harsh realities can no longer be concealed. The worst thing we can do is adopt that worldly spirit whose solution is simply to anesthetize our young people with other messages, with other distractions, with trivial pursuits. Perhaps those of us who have a reasonably comfortable life don't know how to weep. Some realities in life are only seen with eyes cleansed by tears. I'd like each of you to ask yourself this question. Can I weep? Can I weep when I see a child who is starving, on drugs or on the street, homeless, abandoned, mistreated, or exploited as a slave by society? Or is my weeping only the self-centered whining of those who cry because they want something else? Try to learn to weep for all those young people less fortunate than yourselves. Weeping is also an expression of mercy and compassion. If tears do not come, ask the Lord to give you the grace to weep for the sufferings of others. Once you can weep, then you will be able to help others from the heart. At times, the hurt felt by some young people is heartrending, a pain too deep for words. They can only tell God how much they are suffering and how hard it is for them to keep going since they no longer believe in anyone. Yet in that sorrowful plea, the words of Jesus make themselves heard. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Some young men and women were able to move forward because they heard that divine promise. May all young people who are suffering feel the closeness of Christ and the Christian community that can reflect these words by its actions, its embrace, and its concrete hope. This Good Friday, may you know in the depths of your heart that God hears your tears, and in fact, he cries as well. All he does is to love you and to serve you. May you experience that this love, his love, this day, and may you embrace the love he has for you. So Anna, just imagine my surprise the other day when I watch the News 12, and there we are making the news. I know, it's pretty cool, right? Yes, I couldn't believe it. News 12 did a piece on Spelman and how we're handling distance learning. And CS1 got a mention. Let's take a look. When this letter was sent March 13th, announcing that Cardinal Spelman High School would be moving to remote learning, senior Olivia Barrios Johnson had an emotional reaction. It was really sad. It was really sad because as a senior, you know, you look forward to the end of your senior year, doing all the events and activities that you had planned all these months, all your hard work finally paying off. Especially because that same day, it was decided the school's production of Aida would be postponed. Barrios Johnson is set to play the starring role. I had written a poem on the opening, what would have been our opening night of the show, and I was just inspired. So I wrote this little poem and I shared it with my uh, castmates. And then my director actually sent it to the administration in my school. And I think it was just a nice way for me to express how I was feeling at the moment. That poem now featured on Cardinal Spellman's Twitter. It's one example of how the school is using social media to keep students connected during social distancing. If they can't the classroom together, Together, Principal Daniel O'Keefe says with all school activities postponed through at least April 30th, he's appealing to students to submit videos and stay in touch with their classmates virtually. One thing I've learned over my four years at Cardinal Spelman is that Spelman is a family that knows how to overcome adversity. They can also keep up by tuning in to a weekly show on YouTube. Good morning, Spelman. Produced by students. With prom scheduled for May and graduation in June, the principal is staying optimistic, promising his seniors that no matter what, they will get to take part in those traditions. There's something that's been circulating to the alumni, the current students, that they like to stay Spelman strong. We're Spelman strong. We'll always be Spelman strong. We are the pilots and we are going to get through this together as a family. Excuse me for a sec. We have breaking news. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message from your student government. We go live now to Vice President Rosalie Gutierrez, who reports from the safety of the VP's residence. Please know that your student government is engaged and still working for you. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosalie, and I just wanted to come up here and spread some positivity because I know we're all scared. We're all scared of the future and what's to come. And 
to that, I had to say, this pandemic has an end. We're going to have that one day where everything's going to go back to normal. We get to hang out with our friends again. We get to celebrate those birthdays that we couldn't celebrate because of quarantine. We had to go back to school, you know. And when that day comes, we had to make it memorable. Um, I know we're also scared about events, you know, such as prom and graduation. They might be canceled or postponed, but you guys have to have faith that everything will turn out great. Uh, Spelman has been amazing in their response to the situation. And Mr. O'Keefe has assured us that he will do everything in his power to make sure that we have prom and graduation and we're holding him on to that. So yeah, um, guys, we just had to have hope and faith that everything will turn out amazing, that we get to see Cardinals players in their production of Aida soon, that we get to see our friends play spring sports in front of their family and loved ones, you know? And yeah, Spellman, we are one strong family. We will get through this together. And now more than ever, we need each other. So guys, stay inside, wash your hands, and keep up with your schoolwork, okay? Bye. And now it's time for our weekly look at a day in the life of a pilot. He's got the whole world in his hands 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 Ooh, in his hands
keep those videos coming, pilots. You can send them to video at carmenspelman.org. We're going to take a moment here to share a day of life of two of our CS1 members here who have family who are in the front line when it comes to fighting the coronavirus. Haley, Anna, why don't you tell us who in your family is in the medical field? Haley, let's start with you. Oh, my mother is. And my cousin is. Wonderful. Uh, so what exactly is their job at the hospital? My mother's a dialysis technician, so she works in a dialysis um, center here in Manhattan. Nice. And my cousin is a labor and delivery nurse. Great. So they both have some very good paying jobs. Yes. <laughs> 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 All right. So they are some pretty brave people we see. Uh, how are they dealing with the outbreak of COVID-19 in hospitals? Um, I think there's just taking it with precaution, step by step, making sure you have your mask and your gloves on, keep your distance away, although like they can't really keep their distance away, they're helping others, but just to be um safe and just have the mindset everything's gonna be okay. Yeah, they're being very cautious with patients and washing their hands before treating a patient and also after, so yeah. the flu disease is limited. But yeah, like Haley said, they're being very cautious. Yes, definitely. Being cautious is probably one of the best keys to being in that environment, you know? Definitely. All right, so now, recently there was a statement made publicly uh, stating that New York hospitals are hoarding supplies and equipment. Did this make them feel any kind of way? Um, it, it just made my mom feel a certain way. She thinks that it's, like, inappropriate, and some of these people that are stating this aren't in the front lines and don't know what it's like. She works with these patients, and they're very short on equipment, and she has to buy her own equipment half the time. And we shouldn't have to per procure our own equipment. People are buying more than they should, and other stores are price gouging. So it just makes it harder for those who don't have money to buy it. So, um, Pretty much my cousin said the same thing. Um, she said that there are lies and that because supplies are so low, it's also putting them in danger. Um, there's a, a specific mask that they use. It's called the N95. Yeah, and it's only supposed to be used once. But in my cousin, I can't speak for Haley's mom because I don't know Haley's mom. But I can only speak for my cousin. And she said that they're given one mask and they have to use it over a four-week period. Yeah. So if you I, think about yeah. it, they're, getting, they're more at risk to get it. And Definitely possibly infect a patient yeah and like i said my cousin is a labor and delivery nurse so she works with infants and moms and dads and if an infant gets infected they might pass away and it's really sad because it's like so much could be like oh i don't even know what to say like yeah, yeah it's, understandable. it's a very hard topic to talk about like because we're teenagers and like we have family members that are going through this it's like yeah it's hard it's okay it's definitely understandable yeah. so um obviously this has an effect how does this affect you guys knowing that your family members are working in hospitals during this pandemic um it's very hard especially if someone close to you like anna's cousin or even a mother or father like me but since um my mother's working with these patients that are positive. I can't stay home, so I'm currently with my aunt. And it's hard knowing that I'm not going to wake up, you know, see her, say, hey, mom, what's up? You know, talk to her face-to-face -face instead of FaceTime. It's hard, but you know, like, she's doing a good job. She's doing everything in her, like, anything that she can do to help these people, which is, like, she's a hero to me. So there's nothing else. Like, I, all I can do is just thank her and love her. Yeah, like, it's hard. And it also is kind of scary because... Haley said it like both of our family members are working with positive patients and my cousin did show symptoms of corona and like it's scary because you don't know if they're gonna make it like this is a type of disease where it's unpredictable and it could literally it could be in anyone like so yeah there's that fear factor but at the end of the day like I love my cousin and she's helping other people and i admire that and i respect that and, and i'm proud to say i'm her cousin her little definitely. Cousin. proud to say i'm she's my mother <laughs> yeah i can definitely see you guys concerns but as um on behalf of us i can definitely thank your cousin and your mother for the job that they're doing out there uh they're very brave for it 
I really Thank don't you. know if I can personally handle things like that. So I really appreciate um, their work. Thank you. So lastly, if you could tell others who are going through this um, something encouraging, what would it be? Um, it gets better. It gets better over time. Just um, be hopeful. Try doing things to keep your mind off of it, which is what I've been doing. Um, still keep in contact with them, you know. But I would definitely say just um, be hopeful, pray, and just hope for the better in the future. Definitely. And, like, there are, I'm not going to lie, in the beginning I was like, oh, this isn't going to, like, it doesn't affect my age group. But it does. And it's, we're living it during a, a, a moment in history. Like, we're going to be in textbooks at some point. And I, the only words I could say is, like, we just have to hope and follow the rules and safety regulations that it will be better, it will clear up, and eventually we will have a prom and a graduation and a fun summer, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> we will all be together. Yeah, be better. Just be patient and pray and hope everything gets better. Yeah. Yeah. That's some very encouraging words. I thank you guys for being here and doing this interview with me. I appreciate it. Of course, Dave. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> yes. And lastly, I would like to thank your family members once again for the great job that they're doing out there in the hospitals. Uh, they are essential workers, and we appreciate them for what they do every day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Last week, we featured the Period Zero Dancers online video assignment. This week, Ms. Villa shares her Italian classes video assignment. The students created images to go along with an Italian song. Excuse my Italian. Andrea Tutto Bene which means everything will be all right. Anno 2020, parte col botto, poi picchia sui denti. Cina vicina, ci contamina, corsa alla mascherina. Come una corona di spine, trafigge la testa, paura della fine. Panico, caos isterico, folla incosciente, allarme pandemico. Calma, ci vuole la calma. In certi momenti difficili ci vuole il rispetto fra simili, ci vuole la calma, ca ca calma, o rischia che scoppia la testa davvero, uniti in un solo pensiero, andrà tutto bene, andrà tutto bene, andrà tutto bene, bene 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 bene. Tanta paura, unica cura, uniti dentro le mura. Come volo rosa guerriera, l'Italia si desta con la sua bandiera. Grazie a tutti voi, infermieri e medici, supereroi. Calma, ci vuole la calma. In tempi moderni da brividi, ci vuole il rispetto fra simili. Ci vuole la calma, ca ca calma. Che esplode la testa davvero, rimane un solo pensiero, andrà tutto bene, andrà tutto bene, andrà tutto bene, bene 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 bene. Ci 
vuole rispetto fra simili Ci vuole la calma, calma, calma Non rischia che esplode la testa davvero Rimane un solo pensiero Andrà tutto bene, andrà tutto bene Andrà tutto bene, 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 bene at the past football season with some of the players from the team. Hey Pilots, I'm Haley Mateo, your sports analyst, and I'm back as promised with two members of the varsity football team, Ethan Butler and Dylan williams Walter. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the past season, and I was their football manager also. So boys, what do you say we jump right in? Sounds good. So as your football manager, I've seen you guys have some pretty tough practices. How do you guys continue to stay in shape during your offseason? Well... I start by uh, – I go to the gym every morning before school, but now that all the gyms are closed, I've kind of modeled my own makeshift gym at home. I took a couple of cinder blocks. I use uh, a cooler, and I use this, uh, like, a, a painting stick as a bench. So I do bench press. I do squats. I do deadlifts, shrugs. I do a bunch of other things. For me, um, like, during school before all this corona happened – um, I usually went to go lift after school. I went to the gym after school. But now that there's no gyms open or anything, I actually have, like, a bike in my house. So I do cardio on that. I just do, like, push-ups, sit-ups, basic stuff like that. Well, that's good. I wish I did any of that. <laughs> so were there any team traditions during the season, pep talks in the locker room before a game, or pregame rituals you all like to do together? Uh, one pregame ritual that we all did uh, is – we uh during the beginning of the year we'd sign a football and we hang it at the top of the locker room at the top of the door, and one ritual that we did was we would walk out and each time we walked out we touched the we touched the ball before each game. Yeah, another ritual was Dylan always led us in a prayer before each game, and that was like we made sure we did that even if like we didn't have time like we would make time for that. I remember that one. <laughs> Would you guys like to share one of your funniest moments on the team throughout your all four years? Uh, um, for me, like freshman year, I remember Coach Crane used to – like we were such a bad freshman team, and he used to kick us out of practice – like the whole team out of practice like at least twice a week. Like he would just be like, you guys don't want to go home. practice over. Go home. Go home. What game do you feel you all played your best as a team? Uh – I feel our best game as a team uh, this year was probably our championship game, you know, because each time we played Kennedy, we lost to them by, I believe it was like by 21, by 21 point deficit each time. But this year uh, we kind of just came out of the woodworks in the championship game and we shocked everybody. You know, we, we had that game and then, uh, Due to a couple of mistakes, it was stolen from us. But at the end of the day, I think no matter what the score says, uh, we we truly won that game. No matter what anybody says, in our hearts and in, uh, in our fans' hearts, we know that we won that game. I honestly, think that our best game was our Mount game because there was so much hype around that game. It's like, and we just didn't listen to the outside noise. And it was a low scoring game, so it was a really like grinded out game. Should have been like, higher scoring. People, you know what I mean? So it was like 
offense was off the table. We had to like buckle down on defense. So we played really good defense, especially. So I know you both mentioned two different games, but what is your biggest accomplishment on the football team also? Mm. Winning a chip junior year. Yeah, that's probably it. Or having three touchdowns in one game. I remember that. <laughs> so that I know this is a pretty big. I know, definitely. So I know this is a frequently asked question, but are you two both planning to play football in college? I've committed and want to share it with us today. Uh, I committed to Hobart College to play football for the next four years. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you. Ethan, um, any little surprises, or are you going to save nah, it? I don't, I don't think I'm playing. I'm playing sports in college, honestly. I think I'm going to just focus just on, on your academics. academics. That's good, though. And lastly, what are your thoughts on the team? And do you have anything you want to say to those thinking of joining or those who are already on the team, being that you two and the rest of the seniors are gone next year? Uh, to everybody that's already on the team next year, don't take next year lightly. Come with the attitude that you want to win the division. Um, try not to goof off as much. Remember, there's time to play, but then there's also times that you have to switch and you have to say, okay, this is now I kind of got to, you know, get my act together and practice the way I should play. Um, well, I guess Dylan got that part handled, but I would say for people thinking of joining, like, don't be scared. I know a lot of people are like, scared to join football. Like, oh, I don't want to get hit. And, like, honestly, I was like that freshman year, too, because like, I never played football before. And it ended up being, like, a great experience. Like, it turned into my favorite sport. Like, don't be scared just because there's kids involved and stuff like that. Well, thank you, too, for joining today. And also, thank you for letting me join in your football experience being your manager. I really enjoyed it, and I miss you all so much. Can't wait to get back to school. Yeah. So Tune in next week, guys, as I interview some of the girls on the softball team. Remember, I'm Haley, your sports analyst. Fly high, pilots. Christina Ricoldi has your Easter weekend weather forecast. Hey, pilots. It looks like it's almost a repeat of last weekend with the clouds coming in and out of the area and warmer weather making for a nice Easter Sunday. Looking at today, there's still a gale warning in effect till 6 p.m. tonight, so watch your hats. Tomorrow and Easter Sunday are both Partly cloudy with temperatures in the mid-50s, but as you can see, those clouds move in, leading to a wet and rainy start to your morning. Have a safe and happy Easter, pilots. Thanks, Christina. And that's going to do it for another episode of The Morning Flight. Before we go, we'd like to take a moment to share with you some highlights of our first 10 episodes of The Morning Flight. Happy anniversary, David. I don't know. I, this might be worse than those people who date and celebrate a month together. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at some videos. I'm Anna Richardson. And I'm David Smalls. We're your pilots. And, and this, this is, is your morning, morning flight. flight. That's all the time we have for today, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Make sure you book your tickets for the next week's morning flight. I'm Anna Richardson. And I'm David Smalls. Fly high, pilots. pilots. Thanks for watching. Make sure you book your ticket to next week's morning flight. Until then, I'm Anna Richardson. And I'm David Smalls. Fly high, pilots.
I, I showed my mom and I was like, yeah, I'm famous now, you know? <laughs> I know. You know that the show is called The Morning Blight, not Good Morning Spellman. The students created images to go along with an Italian song. <laughs> David, did your voice crack? It did, right? <laughs> 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 